Hello everyone and welcome back to Coffee Break Archaeology and the Where Am I podcast episode 10 um, which I'm very glad we've managed to get to. Now I'd just like to firstly apologise that this episode is coming out on Tuesday rather than the advertised Monday. Um, yesterday I was suffering from allergies and hay fever and I sounded awfully nasally and my throat was very sore and I still probably sound a little bit off in this video so I do apologize for that. Now last week I did uh, say that I was making some changes to the podcast and that you know now each new episode will be released on a Monday with uh, sort of clues to where I will be in the next episode sort of throughout the week and those would be posted on my Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, these clues may take a variety of forms, they may be pictures, they may be my own artistic interpretations, they may just be word clues um, or they may be potentially links to articles or other things like that. Now I, uh, this week they were mainly uh, picture clues and a few word clues to go along with those pictures so I hope you are able to catch those. So in our last episode we were, well, in episode 9, we were at the site of New Grange and uh, during that episode I gave you the first of the clues for this episode and those clues were that I'd be at a large Neolithic flint mine in Norfolk, England is the only Neolithic flint mine open to the public in England and the site could be described as grimy now on Wednesday I uh, basically gave the same clues but along with uh, the following picture which of course is my uh, own uh, artistic interpretation of the site taken from inspiration from several different descriptions and sources and then on uh, Friday I gave the following word clues or following uh, well, yeah, clues which were previous interpretations of the site includes a pit dug by Vikings and a Celtic fort. It was first uh, extensively explored and excavated uh, by the by William uh, Greenwell in 1868, and is the site of a controversial Venus and Phallus statues. And I accompanied that uh, those descriptions along with this picture which again is another uh, artistic interpretation of mine of the site uh, based off several different descriptions and sources. So from those clues were you able to uh, figure out where I was? I recall seeing at least one correct response. Uh, I think it was on Instagram uh, by the Old Bones podcast. I'll just give you a couple of moments to think about that or indeed you could just pause the video but I'll give you one final picture clue and if you can actually read the images description uh, uh, you can see on the screen at the moment you'll be able to actually see the name of the site and yes I was at or I am at today Grimes Graves now the picture that you can see on screen at the moment is uh, if you went to the site of Grimes Graves today this is the image that you would be greeted with. The bumps uh, and mounds in the picture are what remains of the mine shafts, pits and the spool heaps from the prehistoric mining activity at the site. So as was mentioned in the clues that I gave Grimes Graves is a large prehistoric flint mining complex in Norfolk, England, dating to the Neolithic, with mining starting in the late Neolithic around about uh, 2650 BC. Uh, this was about the same time as the first stones were being erected at Stonehenge and Avebury, and roughly coincides with the construction of Silbury Hill. All these sites I've previously covered in 
the hashtag where am I either in the podcast or in my uh, posts on Instagram. So to give you an idea of the size of the site, the site today covers an area of around 91 acres and consists of about 433 mines. Although uh, the excavations and recent uh, geophysical surveys suggest that the site uh, used to cover a much larger area. And to sort of give you an idea of scale of some of the mining operations, one of the largest shafts measure around 13 to 14 metres deep around about 12 metres in uh, diameter, and it is estimated that around 2,000 tonnes of chalk had to be removed from these larger shafts, which approximately took about 20 men, about five months to complete. Uh, now, Grime, Grimes Graves is uh, an important uh, site, although all sites are important, but Grimes Graves is one of only around 10 Neolithic flint mines in England. It's one of the only late Neolithic flint mines in England. Um, there are other, about two other known flint mine sites in Scotland and a handful in Ireland as well. Uh, but Grimes Graves was also the first uh, site to actually be identified as a uh, flint mine um, or Neolithic flint mine during the excavations by Greenwell in 1868 and 1870. So before going on to look at uh, the Neolithic and later mining activity at Grimes Graves, <coughs> what was there before the mines? Well the landscape uh, in which Grimes Graves is would have been uh, densely wooded during the Mesolithic period, a time of uh, hunter-gatherers who exploited seasonal uh, resources and food, setting up camps in different areas depending on what was available in each season. Um, the main evidence actually at Grimes Graves itself for this activity is limited to uh, a couple of potential halves and a scattering of a Mesolithic flint tools. Um, so not much, but certainly in the wider areas around Grime, Grimes Graves, there's a lot more evidence for Mesolithic hunter-gatherer activity. But moving on to the Neolithic, the beginnings of farming in uh, Great Britain, the Neolithic arrives uh, circa 4000 uh, BC, and this sort of heralded a significant social and technical changes with the introduction of farming. Flint and flint mining were very important to the new uh, ways of life that came with these changes. Flint mines are actually one of the first identifiable Neolithic sites in terms of chronology and after uh, these sites which the first in England were dug in uh, the, into the South Downs, you start to see the construction of some of the other first types of monuments, such as causewayed enclosures, barrows, and chambered uh, tombs. So the Neolithic miners at Grimes Graves dug these really, really big pits. Now this is a slight mystery that we will uh, cover a bit light later as you know there was perfectly accessible and good quality flint that could be found on the surface or indeed uh, for just, a, just below the surface in other seams. But these miners would dig in these pits which were 13 meters in some places deep. So those are really really big labour intensive activities that were being undertaken with flint antler picks. This would have been quite a dangerous activity. These uh, mines would need to be shored up somehow um, and would have been probably quite confined working conditions with probably quite a lot of people uh, working in quite close proximity. So why were they digging these pits 13 metres deep? Well, at this sort of level, you get to these 
sort of subterranean galleries which held potentially what was considered the best quality flint and it was certainly the flint from Grimes Graves was very dark uh, flint sort of very smooth and may have been considered uh, of culturally or uh, socially significant you know if you had this style of flint then potentially you were had a higher position in society and it was sought over for those sort of reasons and due to the demand of this good quality uh, flint sort of extensive trading networks were developed and flint from grimes graves is found in a much larger area than just its immediate locality so here is a plan of our, how one of the pits uh, may have looked indicating where the main shaft sits and then coming off it these radiating these subterranean chambers where they were extracting a large portion of the flint uh, using flint picks uh, such as the one in the next image so and this is an example of the type of antler picks uh, that may have been used. These were found in quite large quantities actually within the mine and the reason for that we'll explore a little bit later on. So we're going to briefly explore some of my artwork again just to look at some of the activities that may have gone. Uh, the next um, artistic interpretation is really just and in this uh, final image we're going to look at in this part this is how the um, bottom of the pit looks in the modern times this is actually part of the uh, pit that is open to the public at uh, Grimes Graves the grated off areas are again the tunnels which spiral off from the main shaft which lead to these subterranean chambers where the flint was being mined from So now let's explore why they were digging these really, really deep shafts to extract flint that could as easily be collected from the surface and some of the other unusual activities and uh, that were happening at Grimes Graves. Now, as previously mentioned, you know, there was a lot of flint that could have easily been extracted from the surface or from seams just below the surface. So why dig these very, very big pits? Now, like always in archaeology, people often point to a ceremonial or ritual-like purpose for this. And there is a certain amount of evidence to suggest that ritual and ceremonies were happening at Grimes' graves. But to before we get too much into that, I think, first of all, you have to consider that, you know, they wouldn't have known about there necessarily being a better quality or more desirable type of flint in subterranean chambers. This is likely to have been discovered as they started to explore the flint. They started to collect from the surface, dig further down, and they found this flint as they dug deeper down and then it became a highly prized object and then they dug to deliberately seek this out or at least that is what I want to put forward but others you know potentially see it in uh, different ways So what was specifically uh, sought after about what is now called the floor stone, this, this, this subterranean flint? Well, it is definitely of higher quality, but the surface of the flint was a lot darker. It was a much deeper sort of blackness. And again, this may have perceived a higher cultural value protect particularly when it was shaped into certain types of tool flint was not just a 
tool for purely functional purposes. These objects uh, are highly polished. Their construction goes beyond what is necessary for their tasks. Um, and there is some evidence that some of these axes were never actually used and were buried in hordes of objects, suggesting that it may have been part of some form of ceremonial use. But there are other unusual activities also happening at Grimes Graves. Um, finds from the pit suggest that rituals accompanied the everyday task of mining. There are offerings and other unusual things taking place. Chalk platforms have been found which resemble altars which display arrangements of uh, potter, pottery and antler picks and there was even a uh, find of two highly decorated grooved ware pots had been placed on one of these platforms at the base of the shaft um, and in other other of other the pits you know antler picks have been found on platforms and even in one there was a case of the controversial venus statue and carved phallus that uh, i mentioned previously which are potentially thought to be put there during the 1930s excavations by the miners or, or their hands helping excavate the pit as a practical joke to the person who was leading the excavations at the time um, but this is not certain i mean venus statues made from chalk from this period have not really been found before so until more of these are found in similar context to the neolithic we can't really say for certain whether they are genuine or not and again, other um, sort of carved balls, cups, and other objects have also been found in the mines which do not appear to serve any practical purpose. And even when these sort of mines were abandoned, the shafts potentially still remained a focus for special activities. There are evidence for fires being lit on the floors of these shafts. Uh, which had not been used um, for cooking or used as a way of lighting and often this is sort of hypothesized to be as a, some form of purification ceremony. In one of the pits uh, a hand, a Neolithic hand axe made from Cornish greenstone which was highly sought after was found lying on the gallery floor carefully positioned beside two antler picks which lay parallel to each other with their tines facing inwards the tines are the picks between them lay a skull of a, uh, a fallow rope which is a rare type of shorebird and neither the skull nor the axe were everyday objects they were not particularly local to the area so they've obviously come from some distance away and these were not just casually discarded these were very carefully placed or arranged for some reason and again often this is associated associated with some sort of ritual or ceremony uh, when the miners abandoned the gary having exhausted the flint in there um, or abandon it for some other reason and again as the mines were backfilled um, offerings of animal and occasional even human remains were made in one pit a complete skeleton of a dog uh, has was seems to be carefully buried um, and again it's hypothesized that maybe these uh, rituals or ceremonies were offerings which were presented in the hope of ensuring a plentiful supply of flint for future use so again there is a lot of unusual activity going on at grimes graves that cannot be 
explained purely as functional activities. Again, we don't precisely know why these activities were uh, going ahead. Um, I will leave that potentially up to your speculation. If I had to put on it, I would probably largely agree with what I have previously said. These were obviously potentially rituals um, for purification and for ensuring plentiful pl supply of flint, as that sort of makes context in the activities that are going on, and they are obviously not just there for general use or relating to everyday activities. So now I want to move on to look at very briefly the sort of later activity that was uh, happening at the site, starting off with uh, moving into the Bronze Age from the Neolithic. So the first uh, appearance of metal objects in, in Great Britain was around about 2400 BC. And obviously this led to uh, new technology and new um, sort of cultural traditions. Um, mining certainly continued at Grimes Graves into the Bronze Age until round about 2100 BC. Um, that may have then been abandoned and then resumed briefly around 1550 BC and maybe continued for about another century and then eventually just uh, fell into disuse. <coughs> During these later periods, the pits were, shallow, were much shallower than the uh, earlier um, shafts, and they didn't sort of go quite so deep down and explore the sort of underground subterranean galleries, and they laid more on uh, sort of man-sized niches dug about a metre below the uh, the overhanging pit walls to extract the flint. <clears throat> now, people sort of often argue about the significance of flint and flint working um, during the Bronze Age and Iron Age. Um, you know, a, 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 a historical belief is that it completely died out completely to be uh, taken over by um, the, the new metals that were being discovered. Um, and being brought in by trade, but that is now not the prevailing opinion. We do have evidence of the continued use of flint throughout these uh, throughout these ages, but it certainly probably had a less significance than it did, or at least the significance of it did uh, did change. Um, after sort of 1400 BC at Grimes Graves, there's a sudden um, increase in waste in the form of middens that suggests maybe that a, uh, a settlement was uh, <clears throat> at the site, or at least the area was being used uh, for something. Um, other than mining <coughs> that it had been. Um, and these are sort of quite, quite large and have been found in at least four of the Neolithic, uh, previous Neolithic mine shafts. So, so these were dug into the old mine shafts. Um, and in other shafts, there, uh, other sort of pits of the shafts, halves have also been set in the in the hollows of where the shafts had been uh, the middens contained around about eight thousand fragments of a type of bronze age pottery called uh devrel wimbry ware and there's also evidence for um uh, metal working as well and um six tons of uh, worked flint that had been recycled from earlier waste dumps rather than newly mined. Um, other evidence that suggests that there may have been a settlement on the site 
is evidence of textile and leather production, woodworking, and alongside that, um, bones of cattle, sheep, goats, pig, horse, and deer. And also there were uh, evidence of wheat and barley, um, which sort of suggests that maybe sort of uh, cereal cultivation was also going on in the near area. Um, it's been hypothesised that sort of the size of these middens being quite large represent a sort of long-lived settlement, although there has not actually, other than the middens <coughs> themselves, there's been no evidence of settlements such as post holes or other such uh, evidence or floor plans of a um, of, of uh, houses. <coughs> So again, moving on into the Iron Age, there is little evidence of activity at Brian Scraves during this period. Um, but the site uh, does appear to be used as a burial ground between around about 390 and 150 BC. Um, this is a, a, a well-known practice uh, that followed a tradition of reusing existing hollows such as the mine shafts, pits, as graves. Um, two of the most Significant bales were discovered in the upper levels of the shaft of a shaft that was excavated in 1971. The first was of a young adult woman with decorated chalk black plaque by her lip by her hip. Uh, this was later uh, disturbed by the burial of an adult male with a necklace uh, or potentially earrings um, comprising of two iron beads. Both burials appear to have been. Uh, accompanied by ceremonies at which fires were lit and offerings placed beside the bodies. And it is possible that other undated skeletons previously found in the upper levels of the shafts, um, which may have been associated with earlier Neolithic ritual activity, as previously discussed, may actually be of Iron Age in date. But again, they would need to be dated to confirm that. Then moving into the um, Roman Roman period, um, the main activity, again, very little uh, activity actually at Grime Graves, but it does appear that um, during the first and fourth century, the site was at least visited as there was lot, were quite a lot of pottery sherds um, from, and, and these were quite uh, prestigious vessels, uh, which were manufactured in Gaul. Um, Spain and also some local uh, ones from Oxford Oxfordshire and uh, sort of uh, in areas around Peterborough and uh, East Anglia um, but again that's really the only evidence and again you find a lot of pottery Roman pottery associated with earlier uh, prehistoric sites um, things have been suggested that maybe people took picnics or held ceremonies at these sites um, we don't really know that is the only sort of um, evidence that we have from that but again if we move into the sort of Anglo-Saxon period we also sort of get to the origin of the name Grimes Graves the Anglo-Saxons believe that the landscape was the work of the Saxon god uh, Grim or Woden Grimshoe is a corruption of uh, Grim's Howl or Grim's Burial Mound. Grimshoe Mound on the eastern side of the site later gave its name to a local administrative unit known as the Hundred in the late Saxon period, and it became a meeting place of the Hundred Court where disputes were actually settled. <clears throat> Um, in the Doomsday Book in uh, 1086, records uh, record that Breckland, the Heathland area of Norfolk in which uh, Grime Graves actually lies, was the least populated area of East Anglia from the 12th century onwards. Um, manorial lords established rabbit warrens as a uh, practical response to the poor soils which were inadequate for cereal farming and the shortage of peasants to work the actual land. Um, the Warrens actually proved uh, successful as they required little manpower and provided saleable meat and skins. 
Um, from 1224, though, Grand Graves appears to have been owned by the nearby, nearby Broomhill Priory and was probably also used as a warren. <clears throat> so again, moving on into sort of the, the later history and the sort of early uh, antiquarian and archaeological interest in the site. Um, by the 16th century, Grimes Graves may have became sheep pasture. Um, this is suggested by a reference to a rental document of the land dating between 1541 to 1542. The first actual reference to Grimes Graves as a place of antiquarian interest was in uh, Edmund Gibson's additions to William Camden's uh, Britannica in 1695, where the site was described as a hill with small trenches called Gimes Graves. In 1739, uh, the Reverend Francis uh, Bloomfield continued um, the confusion about the, the actual site by describing uh, Gimes Graves as a Danish or potentially uh, Viking encampment. And uh, again, you know, other, other people suggested maybe it had been a Celtic fort. In 1761, John Parker produced a map depicting the site as 25 circles with an additional circle uh, for Grimshoe Mound. The Alden Survey mapped the site in 1824 as a series of hollows on a low spur. This was followed by the earliest known actual sketch made of the site by uh, the Reverend Francis uh, Luke in 1852. But the earliest actual record of excavations took place in 1852 uh, when the Reverend uh, Pettigrew and uh, C.R. Manning dug several pits but it was not actually until 1868 to 1870 when the Canon William Greenwell uh, actually excavated a shaft that excavated shaft that actually Graham's Graves was proved to be a Neolithic flint mine and as uh, previously mentioned it's the first to be recognised as such in Britain. Moving then into the 20th century, more uh, excavations took place in the early 1900s, in 1914, uh, Pits 1 and 2, and others uh, during the interwar years were excavated, um, culminating with Pit 15 in 1939. And then you've got the recent uh, series of excavations, or the, the more recent series of excavations, which uh, took place during the 1970s by Roger Mercer on behalf of the Department of Environment and then by the British Museum. Uh, so that kind of really brings us up to date with the current works. Other works have gone on since, and uh, um, they'll be linked to those in the description below for the video. <clears throat> so that kind of brings us all the way through to the history of uh, Grimes Graves. So again, why is Grimes Graves significant? Um, as I like to say, you know, all, all sites have a significance and have an interest. Grimes Graves, though, I guess is significant is because it's one of the most excavated, really, uh, flint mines in England and gives us the sort of best example of what Neolithic thin mining was like and how important it was uh, for society and giving us a glimpse into maybe some of the rituals and ceremonies um, that were carried out uh, by the Neolithic um, by the Neolithic peoples. Uh, <coughs> But there's still quite a lot to actually be found at Grimes Graves. Grimes Graves has only uh, had a small part of it actually excavated, so there's potentially a lot more that could be found at the site. So again, that brings us, again, I say it's a very, a, a very brief um, look at Grimes Graves. You know, this has um, been going on for uh, over 20 minutes now, uh, or even 30 minutes indeed, <coughs> and uh, I don't want to go on too much more about it, otherwise I feel like I am waffling more than I have done so already. 
So again, I apologize this video has been a bit bitty in places. Again, I'm still not feeling great at the moment, um, suffering from allergies, <coughs> and my mind has been a bit fuzzy. But I hope you enjoyed that about Grimes Graves. I think it's a very interesting site. It's quite an important site, and in a way, it's still quite a unique site just due to the um, scarcity of Neolithic flint mines we have. Um, again, if you want to find out more, as always, there'll be links in the description. Uh, but now it's time for the first set of clues for where we will be next Monday. So get ready with a pen and paper or something. So here are your clues for where we will be next Monday. Next Monday we'll be at the largest hill fort in uh, Sussex, and I believe the second uh, largest in England and one of the actual largest in Europe is also the site of a earlier Neolithic uh, flint mine. And previous interpretations for this site have been a uh, fort built by Julius Caesar, or a fort that belongs to a South Sux Saxon king. So there are your clues. The largest hill fort in Sussex, the site of an earlier Neolithic flint mine, and previous interpretations include being uh, a fort built by Julius Caesar or a fort built by a South Saxon king. Again, I'd just like to thank you very much for joining me for this 10th uh, episode of Where Am I? Do look out for the other clues that will appear during the week. I will tentatively say Wednesday, Friday, and at some point over the weekend. And then hopefully this, this will come out next Monday or it will come out next Tuesday, depending on how I'm feeling. So I do apologise. Uh, for the lateness of this particular episode and I hope you'll join in for the next one. Until then, take care.